Okay, so a lot of us are, uh, you know, homebound. We are going through a difficult time. And uh, a lot of us have uh, been so busy with our lives that we've never had time to catch up with technology or what is available in the market. So today is all about uh, trying to give you an insight into how to change your lives using technology, okay? Some of you may have heard some part of the of the conversation, uh, but I'm going to go through a few things uh, from a medical point of view. And then as I promised you at the end, we'll talk a little bit about uh, financial management and how to look at, uh, you know, getting your finances right and things like that. Okay. So everybody knows this. Uh, we've all heard Bill Gates. We've read this in one place or the other. Uh, life is changing fast for all of us and coronavirus has brought it to the fore. It has very clearly shown us that uh, things are changing very fast. And so the only thing constant in life is change. And that's the most important thing. And change is, is an opportunity, is, is like an opportunity. It's just one word away from chance. So if you change chance, it becomes change. And so don't be afraid of change. A lot of people are afraid of change and I will uh, try and address that. My whole idea of the talk today is to address uh, the resistance to change, okay? I'm gonna mute everybody so that we don't have any noise and then we'll continue, okay? So change is actually, it's a, for me, the way I look at uh, uh, change is it's always an opportunity to, to, to reflect on life and to make, uh, to, to, to live life in a different way, okay? That, that's the real thing. So. If you think you can, you're right, okay? A lot of people are there in the audience who think they can change and they're right. But again, there are a lot of people in the audience who think they cannot change. Uh, that's their attitude in life. And the reality is if you tell yourself that you cannot change, then the chances are you will not change and you're also right. So there is no such a thing as right or wrong. It's your own conversation that you have with yourself that decides whether uh, change is positive for your life or change is a negative factor for your life. So there is no right or wrong. But in cardiothoracic uh, surgery and in life, very often we ask ourselves the question, you know, why should I change? If everything is working well, uh, what is wrong with being in status quo? And nothing wrong with being in status quo. Uh, this phone can still make a call to New York, Paris, uh, London, New York, Tokyo, everywhere. But honestly, if you look into your own lives and practices, if you put a hand into your own pocket, you will see almost everybody's got the latest iPhone, it's got the latest Discos. And the reason why you adopt technology is because technology makes your life easier. And not only your own life easy, technology also makes the life of your patient uh, better. It, technology helps you to get good clinical outcomes. Technology helps to reduce hospital stay. Technology helps to reduce pain. Technology uh, allows the patient to go home faster and to return to uh, return to work faster. So adapting change in our clinical practice actually uh, impacts not just your own life, but it also impacts the patient's life. It also impacts the uh, financial status of your hospital. Uh, it also impacts the uh, society because your family can have you back earlier. And more importantly, because you're back to work early, it impacts the healthcare of the whole country. So everything that I say from now onwards is with that background in mind, that we are here to actually impact the healthcare of the country. And that is why we talk about changes that are going to happen in the near future. The best example I can give is, is, a, is a daily journey of a surgeon. And this is uh, my journey before two weeks ago. Okay, so obviously the coronavirus has changed things uh, in a big way. And I am also continuously adapting to the change, but I'll take you through my daily journey. Uh, a lot of the technology which I show you is actually uh, available uh, in the market, not, not just uh, on, on uh, you know, in the labs and all. These are actually now available in the market. I have access to some, I have tried others, uh, and uh, some of them are updates from the various labs around the world. So this is to give you an insight into what is coming how we're going to change things and stuff like that, okay? So as a cardiothoracic surgeon, as a thoracic surgeon, my life starts early morning. Uh, 4.30 a.m. is usually my start time and my day starts with a gentle music. Reminder, my iPhone goes off and there is a bedside table lamp which will play its music uh, and very, very gently soothe me uh, out of my deep sleep and I'll get up to start my day. 
as soon as I get up, uh, I will actually click on my iPhone and uh, there is a connection downstairs. Uh, my bedroom's on the first floor, so there's a connection downstairs and uh, the eye kettle gets started because the water is already be has been filled in the night before. So uh, as soon as I get up, the kettle is on uh, from the bedroom. I just click the button and the kettle starts and the tea starts to percolate, okay? And uh, just as I'm getting up and rousing, I'm gonna go through my phone, track all my sleep records. I'll see, see whether I've rested well. Did I have a good night's sleep? Did I have a bad night's sleep? I will catch up on my health and fitness from yesterday. Uh, so that I can set my goals for the day. So my watch automatically coordinates with my iPhone and it gives me a tracking of how many calories I have spent last night, uh, what was my health status uh, yesterday. So that, that will help me to uh, motivate me to set targets for today. So these are sort of basic things. And then you walk into your bathroom and then you've got your eye toothbrush, uh, which actually talks to your phone and it keeps a track record of your dental health. It tells you uh, with the color changes from red to uh, green uh, that uh, you have actually, uh, uh, you know, brushed your teeth for two minutes. And this is important because none of us realize what is exactly two minutes, uh, you know. So most of us are in a rush, we've got things to do. So we just rush through the day. But actually this is a new technology which tells you exactly uh, if it is still red in your hand, then you haven't spent the right amount of time. And then if it turns green, then you know that uh, this is good for your oral health. Having done that, uh, you can check your prosthetic health by looking at the uh, P stream. Um, it is all inbuilt within the uh, technology. And as you stand for, uh, for uh, doing what you have to do, uh, you know that your prostate health is, health, is healthy. Uh, your stream is good, the, the, the flow is good. And uh, you've also got uh, ways of measuring uh, fecal occult blood. You've got ways of measuring fecal calprotectin. So instead of taking a sample and sending it to the lab, your, uh, your throne is actually giving you an insight into your health because uh, it, it actually accurately measures what is uh, the composition of your excreta. And it actually very, very early, it gives you warning signs if things are not going correct or if there is evidence of any occult blood uh, within your stools. So this is all inbuilt within the, uh, within the toilet seat. And, and you don't even have to take a sample and send it off to the, uh, send it off to the lab. Uh, done, having done your basic bits that you need to do, you come out and then you want to exercise early in the morning. Um, it's the best uh, sort of uh, time to do your exercises. I have a, a I have a, a, a personal trainer on my phone who sets my targets, and you know I have uh, uh, things designed for the whole week. So you can actually go back into your uh, app and you can do your exercises uh, at whatever level you are. You can do basic levels, you can do advanced levels. If today you don't feel like doing yoga, you can do cardio. You can do, uh, you know, other stuff. So, so it's all personalized and it's all set for you as a surgeon. And just as you're about to finish your exercise and get ready for uh, the next step of life, you send a beam to your eye shower and the eye shower picks up the signal uh, from your app and it sets the temperature right. It sets the exact temperature of what your body needs. So it is able to sense what is your body's temperature. It's able to sense what is the surrounding temperature in your house, what is the temperature outside. And then all these things are manipulated and the correct degree of temperature is set onto the shower as you walk in. Uh, having done that, it's, it's five o'clock. Uh, so first half an hour of your life has been, of your day has been pretty productive. And uh, now you are ready with a cup of tea in your hand and you're sitting on your uh, desk uh, to start your international practice. And, and this is from my life. So I'm sharing all of this because this is what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. So the moment I start my, uh, my international teleconferencing, I will actually probably have a link up with my secretary. Uh, I, have a, uh, I have a couple of secretaries, one in London, one in India, and I also have a digital secretary uh, so I link up with all of them and try to first set the pattern of the day 
try to catch up on how many consultations are lined up for today. What are the operations lined up for today? What are my patients in the other countries doing and things like that. And so this digital secretarial services actually through the day takes your telephones, it takes your emails, it checks everything, it uh, books in the appointments. If you've done any digital uh, transcription, you've dictated any letters, then it will actually automatically transcribe it into a readable format. And uh, so your whole day is managed by the digital secretarial services, which is all online directly through your phone. So you don't really have to even talk to anybody. It all links up automatically. Your practice marketing, uh, you know, if you're in private practice, you need to make sure your, your things are being marketed. Your branding is, uh, is repeatedly put out there. Uh, if you've got bills which have been sent out, your digital secretarial services actually chases these bills and makes sure that there is no outstanding payment. Uh, invoicing is done for the patients uh, either for the next day or the previous day. So all of it happens digitally, even before you have started uh, uh, trying to talk to somebody. Now, having done that, I will then uh, take my dictaphone, which is a digital dictaphone on my phone. There is an app. It's a speech recognition app, any special instructions which I want to place, I will place on my phone and these instructions go to all my various secretaries. Uh, and um, if there are any letters and things that I have to do, any papers which I have to type, uh, I will dictate it into the software. The software automatically recognizes all of the audio. And of course, because you're using the software over a period of time, the, the recognition capability becomes pretty good because these softwares are uh, in fact improved with the usage. So the more you do, the more it is able to understand your accent, your words, your pauses. And so more accurate is the transcription of the letters. So initially when we first started using these uh, many years ago, they were not so accurate, but over a period of time, they have become much more accurate. And now the papers and letters are grammatically checked and factually checked and they're quite accurate. So when they come to me on my desktop, I, I just have to glance through it. I don't even have to make that many changes now. Of course, in the first year or so, we had to make quite a few changes, but now they're all beautifully laid out exactly the way you want. And then uh, I have a software called as DocuSign. And DocuSign automatically signs off all of the uh, letters that are on my desktop. Uh, once I click sign, I've read it and I click sign, it signs off the letters. And it has also got the ability to actually send the letters out to the various patients, to the GPs, the other stakeholders for the patient. So, you know, the other consultant who has referred a patient will get an automatic letter from my laptop uh, signed by me uh, digitally. Uh, and, and, and also uh, DocuSign has the ability to read contracts. Uh, I deal and work with a lot of different hospitals. I deal and work with a lot of different companies. I, I have a lot of other activities going on. So DocuSign automatically picks everything up. Um, uh, along with this digital uh, services, there is one uh, additional service called as uh, medical legal service. So in the medical legal service, the DocuSign will actually pick up my document. My digital secretarial service will pick up my, uh, uh, my contract with whoever I'm signing it and send it off to my solicitor. And then my solicitor will read it. Uh, he will also digitally go through it, make any changes, and then it comes back to me. Sometimes I work with companies when we are trying to discover new technology, when we are trying to discover new, uh, new products for the market. And most of these tech, uh, companies will actually want you to sign what is called as a non-disclosure agreement, because obviously these are highly confidential technologies. So they will actually help me uh, understand uh, the need of the non-disclosure and everything. And the whole document comes back to me and, and I sign it and it just gets uh, signed off. You know what, I forgot to record. So let's start the call. Okay, having said that, uh, once we've signed off all our letters, then the next step is uh, to check the social networking side of things. Uh, usually my digital secretary would have worked on that. Uh, nowadays, almost all practice goes on to social network, uh, you know, uh, and, and you've got to keep up to date with what are the requests of the patients that are coming across to you. 
sometimes uh, some news articles are written and things like that. So you spend a few minutes trying to update yourself on what is the social networking side. Uh, is everything accurately represented or not? And and then you you start the rest of your day. So so you have spent a, a, you know at least 10, 15, 20 minutes going through all of this with your secretary. You've tidied up your day, and uh, you know it's it's about 5:30 in the morning. And 5:30 in, in the morning is when my first consultation starts. Um, I have teleconferences booked for 5:30 a.m. in London time. Uh, the teleconferences could be with individual patients who are in various countries. Uh, they could be, uh, you know, anywhere really, uh, Australia, Africa, um, the Middle East. Uh, and, and then I have uh, uh, appointments booked with international hospitals. So I, I have a link up with many hospitals. The technologies that we use are various depending upon the availability in the in the other hospitals. So, you know, we can use Zoom, Cisco, WebEx, Microsoft Meetings, Google Rooms, whatever you want. There is a lot of technology available depending upon whatever is the level of safety, security, and the needs of that country. You, you cannot decide uh, uh, one technology and stick to it. You, you have to actually use a mix of technologies and, and you try and uh, fit it to what is the need of the country. And so different countries are used different uh, link ups. Of course, you, because data of the patient is coming across uh, borders, uh, you have to make sure that uh, whatever uh, teleconferencing modality that you use, it has to go through the, go through the security of the hospital. So all of that uh, security has to be very high level. You've got to make sure that uh, all the data that reaches you is confidential. And, and all of us uh, within my whole practice group are actually registered with, uh, with the ICO. It's called as Informational, Information Commissioner's Office. Uh, Information Commissioner's Office is a registration where once you register with them, you are actually agreeing to data confidentiality clauses. Um, in last year in June, uh, Europe came up with a new concept of called a GDPR. And GDPR is the, is, the, is the new standard for data confidentiality. And so nobody can collect your data without your consent. And we, because we are all registered with the information commissioner's office, uh, we have actually signed up to the GDPR. So anything that I do on my computer, on my laptop is all highly secure. And uh, most all of it uh, complies with the GDPR requirement. So more, most of the time we are fairly happy that whatever confidential data that is being passed across to my laptop or to my phones are all uh, under serious security uh, uh, covers. Uh, then uh, starts the video consulting with the patient. Uh, usually it is uh, multi-level consulting, which means uh, I am on one. Uh, I am on one platform, and uh, my patient uh, will be on the other side. But at the same time, his family could be anywhere in the world. So I have consulted with patients who are in the Middle East. Uh, the son is in Australia. The daughter was in America, and all of them log in together, and and we have uh, a large. Uh, sort of a web consult with not only the patient, but also the family. This actually helps to develop a relationship and a rapport with everybody. And more importantly, it helps you to answer all the questions that people are asking or any doubts they have in their mind about the treatment or, or you know, the other options that are available to the patient. So it is almost like a multidisciplinary meeting with the family rather than the other physicians. But I also have the option that if they want to discuss with an oncologist, then and on the same call, I can actually log in an oncologist. For example, I had a patient from uh, Australia who presented with melanoma, uh, had treatment, oncological treatment in Australia, uh, was taking uh, immunotherapy in another country. Her husband was a diplomat. And so he was posted in another country. So the immunotherapist uh, was in uh, another country. I was based in uh, England. So when I spoke to this patient's family, uh, she was in Australia. Her uh, 
children were in England. I was in England. Her basic oncologist was in Australia and an immunotherapist was in a third country. And we were all talking at the same time, deciding what is the treatment, best treatment options for this patient. So many, many times nowadays, because of this digital technology, we are able to talk freely with any physician uh, and, and any surgeon together. And, and the beauty of it is that we are actually linked online with the radiology department. So my radiologist can be in a fourth country. He doesn't really have to be in the same place as I am. And he will share all the data with me and he will uh, discuss the radiology in detail, showing me the images. I will ask him the required question. He will give me the necessary answer. So it's like a online uh, multidisciplinary meeting, but a truly international experience. So having done that, then the patient, wherever he is, uh, we usually have outreach clinics uh, in various centers. And if the patient is able to log into the outreach clinic, uh, that is fantastic. Otherwise, uh, we try to make sure that they have access to some of the devices which I'm going to show. So if they get into the outreach clinic, then the patient's blood pressure gets taken and gets logged on onto my computer. His vitals are recorded, temperature, pulse, respiration, and directly from his own phone or the phone of the outreach clinic, everything is uploaded to me sitting in another country and I can get a whole analysis of the basic uh, workout for this patient, including his weight, his body fat analysis, et cetera. Uh, what's his diabetic status, uh, you know, what is his blood glucose status. And, and uh, there is availability of eye stethoscopes. And these actually are fantastic devices. So you don't really physically have to be next to the patient. Uh, you log on your iPhone or the patient's iPhone onto the stethoscope and, and, and whoever is the nurse at the other end will auscultate the uh, chest for me. And I will get all the signals on the other side uh, either via the internet or Bluetooth enabled and, and all, all the interpretation can be done by me as if I am almost physically present with the patient. Uh, there are other devices which uh, this is used by the orthopedic surgeons who do uh, bone density scanners uh, and, and particularly in the chest when we have got metastasis to the ribs. This is a good device which will actually highlight to you areas uh, with defective lesions on the ribs. Uh, there are endoscopes attached. This is a camera actually, and it's in the form of an otoscope, or you can have a uh, oral uh, camera attached so the patient can put it in his mouth and you can have a look and everything comes to you onto your desktop and you can make a direct uh, analysis of uh, at least the basic vital parameters of the patient. Um, this is a new technology which has come in called as home blood test kit. A uh, patient does a pin prick and this cartridge which you see here, he, he just puts it onto the cartridge. The cartridge then goes into the machine and the machine automatically analyzes all of the blood results. You know, renal function test, uh, liver function test. You can match, mix and match with whatever you want. And then that result in, in a live scenario can get actually transmitted to me. Some tests take much longer, but at least the basic test can be transmitted live to me on my phone or on my uh, screen. And I can actually see uh, whether this patient's got anemia and things like that. Uh, specific situations when people talk about allergies and things, this is a superb technology called as NEMA, where uh, you can, you know, if the patient's got allergy to certain things, uh, this can be handed out to the patient wherever he is about to eat his dinner. He can put the little bit food into this uh, device and immediately it will sense whether he, there are any allergens for the patient or not. And if I want to use it uh, to test my patient, I will get a live report of any allergens and uh, I can advise the patient accordingly. On my systems, I've got uh, almost every electronic reference tool and calculator that you can imagine. So if I need to uh, assess the risk score, if I need to assess any cardiac uh, comorbidities, uh, if I need to assess any thoracic comorbidities, if I want to have thoraco score, uh, I want any other, any other information of the patient. I have the calculators on my, uh, uh, on my uh, smartphone and I can actually very easily, it takes me less than two seconds to find out what is the predicted post-operative FEV1. All you have to do is punch in the numbers and, and the number comes out on the other side. So these are very, very good tools. 
not only are our devices available for ensuring that you do preoperative there are also devices available for ensuring that you have medication adherence particularly when we talk about tuberculosis or when we talk about elderly patients when we are prescribing some medication to an elderly patient very often the patient may actually forget whether he's taken the medication or not taken the medication same thing with tuberculosis the patient may not take the medication that's why you have the dot program to ensure that the patient takes the medication so these are devices on the bottles of the of the of the medication the cap is specially designed every time the cap is open there is a link to the bluetooth and uh, and a box gets ticked that the patient has opened the cap and then when he takes out a tablet and he closes the cap the cap actually measures the weight of the remaining tablets so moment you know what is the weight of the remaining tablet you can actually calculate how many tablets did the patient take out and how many tablets did he take of course uh, it, it depends on you know the patient can throw it into the sink that that you cannot monitor but at least it tells you that the patient has put in the attempt to take the tablet out and uh, do that so this sort of information comes to us pretty quickly and and it is quite helpful for us to uh, analyze things sitting in a remote location uh ecg probes are now available on the on the iphones you just need to plug it in and put these uh, leads and the ecg gets taken up particularly when a patient is getting acute mi you just plug this in you plug it into the iphone the iphone through the world wide web will uh, quickly contact the nearest uh, cardiologist who can actually give you live uh, uh, support and can give you live uh, instructions on what to do next uh the similar things are in the thoracic world uh, you can actually the patient can blow into this device and uh, purely by blowing into this device which is attached to his smartphone we can get a whole lot of uh, spirometry and uh, various readings so these are not just good for uh, pre operative diagnosis but also for knowing uh, how well the patient is responding to treatment and also when the patient gets discharged you can actually keep a follow up on the patient to know that uh, there is no uh, early drop in fev1 and things like that so these are sensitive uh, technologies that are helping us to to detect complications early and they are also helping us to follow up patients to make sure that they are uh, following adequate treatment protocols and all of this is cloud based so the patient is here and moment he coughs or whatever it all gets uploaded into the cloud and the physician gets involved and the physician can actually then feed back to the patient or feed back to the device that the patient is reading whether uh, the dosage is accurate or not accurate um sometimes in a couple of hospitals uh, they have a uh, uh, guided ultrasound so this is a very nice technology which links on to your iphone and and sometimes a patient is in the ane with an acute uh, injury or something like that and and i have asked them to link the ultrasound to the phone or to their computer and they do a rapid scan and as they are doing the scan the image is being relayed back to me and i can actually guide despite not being in the country uh, you know the accident could have happened somewhere in the middle east and i could be sitting in london and they will send me these ultrasound scans very very quickly to tell me whether there is hemothorax or things like that and then i can guide the local physician on on whatever is the next step of management or i can tell them do a ct scan and things like that there is also availability of these uh, daily health monitoring apps which which are fantastic particularly i health is a very very big thing in the apple environment and uh, apple watch and apple phones are are really the next uh, big health uh, uh, frontier that uh, we will all face and if we don't adapt this technology early i think we'll be left behind so it's very very important to keep abreast of all the technologies that are available to you and that are coming out to you live uh, having said that uh, once you've done uh, a few of your teleconsultations in the morning uh, it's time to do the ward rounds i may have operated on a patient in one country and i may have uh, uh left the country to go to the next and uh, so i have access to a ward round my team will actually take the ipads 
uh, the electronic medical record of the hospital is stored on my phone as as an app so i can log into the app uh, i can log into anything about the patient no matter which country i am so i can see the daily uh, graph of the patients i can see the blood results i can see the ct scans i can see today's x ray uh, everything can be accessed from one single point of uh, access and it all comes onto your iphone or it comes onto your uh, desktop screen and so it's very easy to do a ward round with your team your team carries the ipad around and updates you on each and every patient that you have done and that is the way we conduct an international clinical practice as i told you many a times i get called into the er situation uh, i may not be in the country this is maybe a remote hospital where they don't have a thoracic surgeon and they have got a chest trauma they will actually phone me and say so and so is coming in with so and so trauma and i will actually get on to what is called as a cow computer on wheels the computer on wheels is a vr system which actually allows me to look at the patient uh look at the staff and gives me an input into what is happening and i can guide the local physician or the surgeon or the nursing staff to what is the next uh, step uh, in the management of the patient and uh, you know the time is still 7 o'clock and and we've already finished uh, you know uh five countries teleconferencing we have finished uh, ward rounds uh, in uh, various continents across the globe uh, and we have already done most of our paperwork uh, with our international secretary so even before you wake up i have actually already finished almost uh, a huge chunk of my uh, of my responsibilities and then it is time to go to work now this was a few weeks ago when i was actually traveling to work so i would book my ticket using the app uh, i usually take a train to go into central london i live near heathrow i don't usually uh, drive into london because it's almost impossible and then you read your newspaper on the phone you check your stock prices it is important to make sure that you're financially secure things are going well for you uh, any banking requirements as i'm sitting in the train it takes me an hour to get into central london you do your online banking uh, do all the stuff that you need to do uh and then get into the hospital do your physical ward round as we would normally do and then once you've done your physical ward round it's time for theater and most of us uh, usually operate on a daily basis uh once you're in theater then uh, the whole scenario changes the question is does the phone have any role in the theater now i've shown this before to people and i've said that uh, whenever you think of thoracic surgery you think of all these big incisions but i was very fortunate to get involved with the vats program very very early in my training days uh, along with kale demer and we we really pushed the boundaries of vats and that vats was the predominant reason why i moved from cardio thoracic to mainly thoracic practice because we were doing such good vats and so much amount that it really became beautiful and then various authors around the world have pushed the boundaries of that so joel dunning has spoken about micro lobectomy where he has reduced the size of the incision to 5 mm ports these were 10 mm ports uh, alan siho in hong kong spoke about needleoscopic thoracic surgery where he reduced the size from 5 mm to 3 mm and then 2 mm uh then uh, the people in the us uh, spoke about two ports vats and then uh, diego gonzales rivas uh, calvin nag and alan ceo really pushed the envelope into uniportal vats and and over a period of time they have shown us that anything and everything is possible on the uniportal platform but pain continues to be an issue in the with thoracic surgery when you go through the chest wall so other people are looking at other uh, accesses for the chest wall uh, masin zelinski talks very highly about trans cervical lobectomies he is a guy who does a lot of vamla and temla which is mediastinal lymph node dissections and he is very comfortable to access the whole of the pleura right or left through the cervical route so he does a trans cervical lobectomy the problem with that is you're left with a visible scar so the so the taiwanese guys cc liu uh, and then now the chinese guys from guangzhou have uh, said that instead of going transcervically why don't we go subzipoid 
and so the 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 bandwagon has moved into sub z point lobectomy and i know uh, at least of two or three people who are working on trans umbilical lobectomy where through the umbilicus they dilate the uh, umbilical vein and pass in a, a camera probe across the diaphragm into the chest and this has been done on a pig and and it is showing that it may be a natural orifice technique to to do a trans umbilical lobectomy uh, i told you this uh, yesterday or day before the jianjian uh, a uh, has really revolutionized the whole concept of surgery uh, by making it into awake thoracic surgery and not only awake thoracic surgery but he's gone down the road of tubeless valves where he doesn't use any central line no endotracheal tube no urinary catheter no arterial lines and he has written a textbook on it and proven that really these are things that are possible so technology is moving along and then of course we come into the other era of robotics and that's another world altogether and i'll talk about it so the question is do smartphones belong in the or and let's look at what is possible with your smartphone in the operating theater how can you change uh, your 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 uh, concepts so we are all traditionally used to this big trolley uh, you know the hd screen and uh, we've got all these insufflators light source uh, uh, xenon light source led light source everything is uh, available but now it has all moved on you do not need this big trolley at all what you need is this small uh, camera device which actually plugs onto the end of your endoscope so this device is all that you need all of this has been now condensed into this and you just need this your laparoscope to plug into this wireless device and this is your light source and this wireless device has the ability to beam the uh, picture intrathoracic picture to anything so you can have a ipad you can have a phone or you in your own theater you can have a 72 mm screen the the new uh, technologies that are available the newer television screens are all 4k compatible uh, and uh, 4k compatible is uh 2200 uh, byte uh, whatever number and so these are very high definition screens and you don't need to physically connect any wires from a to b and the other important thing is that this wireless thoracoscope can actually be carried in a small briefcase so you don't need to buy a separate uh, scope for various hospitals you just finished in one hospital do whatever you have to do get it cleaned plug it into uh, put it into your briefcase and move on to your next phase so things have changed quite dramatically monitors are no longer really in uh, i think in the next 5 years or so we will see almost all monitors dying off uh, we are now entering into the image display technology which google first uh, showed in in its patented technology of google glasses so the image now is actually being projected either onto the screen in front of your eyes your uh, thing or it's being uh, projected across a small horizontal device the beauty of this is if you if you know a little bit about optics uh, it, you will understand that when you reduce the distance between the screen and your eyes and you 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 change the way it is projected you can get a 72 inch three dimensional view in front of your eyes straight away so this has a potential to blow up a the picture to a very high high size and you can also get a very high definition picture so both of these if you wear you don't really need any television screens the good thing about using something like this is it's very very good for your neck and your shoulders because when you're operating in theater and you're trying to do surgery looking at a television monitor the problem is that your neck and shoulders start to hurt and very many times we've had thoracic surgeons we've had cardiac surgeons who actually have to leave their careers and leave their jobs because of back pain so this new technology will actually help you to overcome those issues and you can keep your neck and your shoulders in a position where you are absolutely comfortable uh technology has also gone down the 3d route so we know there are uh, thoracoscopes available which have 3d technology in them and you wear these glasses 
on your on your face and you look at the screen and you get uh, quite a decent uh, 3d image with this uh, but smartphones have now gone 3d and this was a technology which i tried out in taiwan and and it was just unimaginable and really i couldn't believe the depth of perception that you got with this sort of device on your head and and this is all connected to your smartphone and not only that along with the, this technology that i've got on my head you can add a fourth dimension of a virtual reality so the virtual reality plus this uh, thing on your head gives you an amazing view of what you're looking at and so when you're operating you don't need to move your head too much everything is in front of you it's three dimensional and the depth of perception is just as good as robotics so that is why these technologies are really going to change the way we are going to talk about uh, surgery and I, these are not in the future these are already here i visited uh, professor sangun jeon in in south korea a national university and uh, he has got a theater called a smart or and in the smart or all these technologies are available there are at least 10 15 20 screens at any at any particular time and on a flick of a button they can relay any operation to any part of the world you name it and they can relay the operation live uh, to wherever you like so it is just unimaginable the quality of uh, technology that has gone into that so we know about 3d technology uh, we know about 3d ct reconstruction these are two separate technologies but the real fun is the next technology which is called as augmented reality image overlay guided surgery which means that when you are operating in the chest or in the abdomen the 3d dimensions of the ct scan are actually taken and overlaid on the uh, organ that you are seeing so the pathology can be seen in three dimensional even before you reach it so if you are dissecting the pulmonary artery by an image overlay guided surgery you can actually see what is behind it so sometimes when you are dissecting the bronchus and you can't get behind it there is a risk that you might actually damage the pulmonary artery but this technology with the 3d ct reconstruction allows you to look behind the structure to understand what is the uh, what is the problem on the on behind that particular structure and thus it makes surgery more safer and not only the platform is available on the on the head for head headwear but it's also available on ipads and these ipads can be intraoperatively put into a a uh, protective shield and uh, you can then uh, you can then easily uh, sorry one minute i have to switch off these guys whoever is making noise so this this actually uh, sorry so this makes your surgery safer and at any point the real success of a surgery is vision and if you can see beyond a structure and if you can take away all of the blind spots then the chances of complications reduce dramatically and that is why this technology is quite important and not only that this technology also has the ability to navigate you so you can actually be guided into what is the next step so this is somebody putting in a para paravertebral catheter or is it an epidural catheter and actually the technology they are looking on the screen they are not looking at the back of the patient and the technology is picking up the position of the catheter and the 3d ct is already superimposed in here so as the cat as that needle is moving in it is telling them exactly where is the paravertebral space or where is the epidural space so intraoperative navigation softwares are, are the next big thing which i think all of us will use to make our surgeries uh, more uh, more clear and i think they will play a big role in surgical fields as well because doing a segmentectomy or more importantly doing a sub segmentectomy you really need to know the 3d pathology of the venous drainage and the arterial supply and this sort of technology will give you a live three dimensional reconstruction on a patient when you are doing a segmentectomy or a sub segmentectomy 
Philips has been working with this uh, project. This is called as uh, image projection or holograms. So again, the CT scan uh, can be actually uh, projected. You don't need a viewing box. You don't need a computer in front of you. Everything is sensor-based. Sensor and all you have to do is move your uh, fingers apart and the uh, art will come up. Or if you want to see the angiogram, you move your fingers and you can turn your fingers around to actually rotate the whole image three-dimensionally. So it will give you, uh, you know, you can see in front, back, top, bottom, name it, and you can use it to see. So this is a hologram where there is no actual screen, but the image is being reproduced in front of your eyes and the movement is correlated with your hands. So as you move your hands, you can see what, uh, you can see any part of the organ that you're dealing with. Uh, we are all fortunate to work with this sort of technology called as the hybrid OR, and I've given you a talk on endobronchial navigation. The hybrid OR comes into its own when you're talking about endobronchial navigation because it has an interoperative, what is called as a Dyna CT. So this device that you see here is a Dyna CT. You have interoperative screenings, you have uh, name it, uh, it's all in there. And you can do localization of small uh, lesions in the lungs. You can use endobronchial navigation technology, highlight the tumor, inject a dye, uh, inject a fiducial marker, and uh, then turn the patient over and go in by VATS and do a, a, a VATS uh, resection. And this is called as image-guided VATS, so iVATS. And these are all uh, thanks to the uh, hybrid OR that we have access to. Of course, the Japanese have come up with the RFID chip concept. So they take this RFID chip, which is loaded onto a bronchoscope. This is not that chip. This is just to represent a chip. So this is a, um, a catheter technology where an RFID chip is loaded onto a catheter and you put in a bronchoscope and you inject the RFID chip wherever you think is the tumor. And then when you go in by VATS, on the side, you can actually beep and you can find out where exactly is the tumor. And you can use multiple RFID chips to find out multiple GGOs. Uh, so this is all the help that you get in theater to make your surgery safe. And this is all the help that you get in theater to better visualize and more importantly, to take away the blind spots. Now, as I told you, and I keep telling you again and again, that the most important part of an operation is recording the operation. And the second most important part is editing that recording. So you, many, many, many times over the years, I have found that you do a very good operation and then you look up and you realize your uh, circulating nurse forgot to switch on the uh, recording device. And so that is lost for posterity. You can never learn anything anymore from that case. So recording is a very big thing that I think most, most of us should pay attention to. A lot of us have this access to IDA uh, recording devices, but now even that is going to go out of the windows because we are now entering into a world of smart contact lenses. These smart contact lenses have a, have a chip inside it and they have the circuitry uh, within it. You wear it on your eye. And as you wear it, the vision that you are seeing is getting transmitted to this contact lens. If you want to start recording, you blink your eye and the recording starts. If you want to stop recording, you blink your eye and the recording stops. So you no longer have to depend on anybody else to do your recording. And the beauty of this contact lens device is that it has the ability to link to a Wi-Fi HDD. So these HDDs have now become Wi-Fi or Bluetooth enabled and your smart contact lens actually talks to this device. And so you don't need, uh, you know, you don't need too much uh, hard disk on that contact lens. You can beam the image to this HDD and this HDD has potential of going from one terabyte to four terabytes. In fact, now we've got eight terabytes available. So once your HDD is full up, you just pull it out like taking a cassette out of a tape and then you put in another HDD and you start recording again. So there is no question of ever losing recording. There is no question of ever uh, not recording an operation. These technologies actually will help you to record dynamically as you are doing the operation. 
a uh, lot of people uh, want to record open surgeries and uh, i personally for open surgeries i have a gopro uh, which i can mount on my head head mount the gopro has a has a mount which you can click on to the head mount and it will record and all of the gopro activities can be con uh, controlled with a iphone so my assistant who is not scrubbed outside is watching it on his iphone and when i tell him record this bit he just clicks a button and it automatically records all open surgeries for cardiac surgeons the same device is available on your surgical loops so this is the camera here this is the uh, light source and these are your loops the same thing here they have become smaller and smaller these are slightly older pictures the, the loops have actually now the cameras on the loops have become lighter and smaller and they are very comfortable to wear so any open surgery that you're doing on the cardiac side including anastomosis valve surgery and things everything that you see through the loop is actually recorded by the camera so there is no question of your head coming in the way or your assistant's hand coming in the way it is your sight whatever you're seeing dynamically will get recorded by that uh, surgical loop so that's so much so about uh, vats and things like that for me robotic surgery is a completely different world for me it's a revolution rather than an evolution i certainly do not believe that uh, robotics is an evolution of vats i think it's a completely different technology a completely different platform and and this is the one platform where you get in touch with technology on a personal basis it's very intuitive it is designed to your needs as a surgeon so every single surgeon can have his own profile on the robot machine and every single surgeon can actually uh, do the surgery according to his requirements now because i work across many countries and many hospitals i have access, i've worked on the s si uh, xi uh, so you name the platform and it is available in various uh, various hospitals and so sometimes i have to remember what is the platform and what are the differences between the various platforms and and i'm also fortunate to have access to a dual console robotic program where you have two consoles so you can teach very well and i personally am very happy to make the statement that everything that is possible by open thoracotomy is possible by vats and is possible by robotics when you sit on a robo robot actually you're doing when you sit on a robot what you're trying to do is you are trying to dock the robot <coughs> you make your three ports these are the three ports that you see and your team is really important your team is actually moving the robot into position when we started the program docking the robot was a big thing we actually had to learn how to dock a robot but now uh, it's not a big deal uh, what you should take 45 minutes now can be done in minute 30 i think this video when it was recorded we did probably in 2 minutes and 42 seconds so really from the point that you start to the point of the robot docking changes uh, pretty dramatically and you can actually uh, dock pretty easily uh, the robot it's all a teamwork and everybody understands what is needed once you've docked the robot you have access to this uh, screen you sit on the screen uh, you then uh, you then uh, uh you 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 press in a button which recognizes your setting the height of the robot changes according to your setting then your feet are working you've got these controls diathermy right diathermy left you have got the camera in your left hand and you've got the fourth arm control the robot has a binocular vision one separate vision for the right eye one vision for the left eye so your brain is the one which makes the 3d formation of the vision so this is a true 3d image so when a structure lies at 1.3 mm on a robotic platform it genuinely lies at 1.3 mm and then you rest there put your hand there put a pincer grip and then you move your pincer grip right left up down in vats it's a mirror image in robotics it's an intuitive image everything that you move is intuitive and so this is the way you get into the chest and you can do all sorts of complex surgeries uh this is a lobectomy which we are doing uh, i have a, a pretty large series of robotic lobectomies for aspergillomas following tuberculosis and i love the robot in this scenario because uh, because of the dense adhesions that you have in the chest wall
the robot actually gives you the ability to dissect into the hilum directly and gives you the ability to uh, isolate the structures which you actually do not get with open thoracotomy with open thoracotomy there is too much dissection and you end up with a lot more blood loss with robotics you actually do a pinpoint dissection and everything is done under vision uh, so every structure is beautifully identified under three dimension so in my opinion the robotic platform makes the surgery safer because the view that the that the surgeon gets is is really second to none and and everything is beautifully magnified this is 10x magnified when i'm looking into the console so for me in technology terms there is no technology which is superior to the robotic technology really it's just a beautiful beautiful thing and particularly when you get into the thoracic outlet and things like that the ability of the robot to lean over the tissue and dissect is just second to none and in an aspergilloma this is very very helpful because the adhesions at the apex of the lung are the ones that give you the most problem robotic platform has gone from uh, three ports to now into a single port uh, uh, robotic surgery this is actually now coming into the domain at the moment it's working well for abdominal surgery but thoracic is not too far away uh, there are two ways to single port it one is you use uh, uh, your current robot and put it all through a single uh, a port with a separate hose which is called as air docking so your robot is docked outside the body and the instruments go in through a single uh, disposable port or this new robot which is the single uh, port robot uh, for called also called as spider robot where you have the camera here and multiple instruments which will allow you to do the same surgery the problem with robotics is all this platform is very bulky you really need a huge hole uh, set up to get this going so this company has come up with what is called as uh, handheld robots so these are called as flextex surgicals and these robots are actually held in your hand so in robotic surgery you are not next to the patient you are sitting on a console with flextex surgical robots you are actually next to the patient and purely by rotating your arms to the right or to the left you can get a 360 degree movement of the tip of the robot and you can get a 7 degree freedom of the endo wrist so these things uh, have made it less bulkier uh, and and has certain advantages uh, when you do these surgeries immunofluorescence in robotic surgery is a big thing uh, use of icg uh, to highlight the vascularity or to highlight the tumor is something that's being worked upon uh, works very well in uh, esophageal surgery when you're trying to get a conduit from the stomach all the way to the chest uh, it's beautiful for identifying the vascularity of the stomach and making a a a, a viable conduit Uh, we are using it in segmentectomies in the chest uh, where it helps you to identify the boundaries of the segment the vascularity of the segment and then you can uh, you know do your segmentectomy via the robotic platform that can be done uh, the icg can be given either intravenously or uh, endobronchially and uh, two of my colleagues are doing a study on this uh, david waller and uh, my friend is doing a study on this uh, uh, sasha and they they are looking at the viability of uh, endobronchial versus uh, intravenous icgs for doing uh, segment tectomies um that is not enough for us as surgeons we want to push the boundaries more so we are going down the natural orifice route i gave you an endobronchial surgery lecture where i told you about endobronchial valves i told you about endobronchial coils and now we have the steerable endoscopes uh, which actually have devices coming out at the tip so you can not just do this for therapeutic uh, for diagnostic purpose but you can also do this for therapeutic purpose the poem is a technology that is used uh, in the esophagus for submucosal resections using these wireless steerable endoscopes these work very well also for uh, trans anal surgeries or trans rectal surgeries when you are trying to deal with uh, carcinoma in situ and trying to do a uh, submucosal resection surgery uh, we have also gone into the world of endoluminal robots the endoluminal robots are are here people are working in the labs i have had the opportunity to work on this where you can actually go endobronchially cut open the bronchus take out the tumor and on your way out close it 
and so that is that is the next uh, advancement in the technology that we'll be using but uh, the the oncologists are not sitting quiet they are working they have got this intravascular nanobot coming in the intravascular nanobot is a technology which is based on uh, precision medicine uh, or it is also called as crisp which means individualized therapy for individualized patient so no longer will you give a blanket chemotherapy regime for a patient you actually do the analysis of the surface receptors of this patient you do of the cancer and then you decide what chemotherapy so it's like a targeted regimen and you load the chemotherapy onto a nanobot so this is the payload on the nanobot there's a micro camera at the tip and there is a sensor at the end the sensor at the end is controlled by the computer outside and you can drive the nanobot intravascularly so intravascularly the nanobot will find its way uh, you inject it in one area and then it finds its way across and reaches the cancer cell uh, intravascularly and it injects the payload into the cancer cell the big advantage of this is number one you reach the area that is the problem and more importantly you reduce the amount of systemic chemotherapy that you need to give uh, because the most problems with chemotherapy is of course the side effects of chemotherapy so the nanobots actually have an ability to reduce the amount of chemotherapy agent that you are going to deliver to the cell and this will actually make the patient more tolerable to take uh, uh, take chemotherapy or to tolerate chemotherapy of course this will also allow you to get into areas which are not accessible by surgery so sometimes the tumor or the metastasis is in a very difficult area where you where it is very dangerous to get in by surgery because of side effects so the nanobot will get into this area being guided by the surgeon or the oncologist and deliver the payload so precision medicine is the real word if a lot of you have not heard this word i suggest you start reading about it because this is really the change that you will have is the genomics of lung cancer we really are uh, are going down the route of tailored approach each patient needs a particular type of as a particular type of cancer according to his genetic uh, makeup the receptors of the surface of the cancer is according to his genetic makeup so the treatment should not be a combination of a b c d it should be specific either a or b or c or d and so this personalized cancer therapy is what is actually revolutionizing the management of cancer and so a general population on the basis of molecular profiling and on the basis of use of prognostic markers can be divided into treatment a b c d e and you then give personalized cancer therapy for these patients and you do what is called as genome editing and the genome editing will allow you to actually target the specific cancer cells that you are dealing with uh so much so for doing your clinical work uh, i think smartphones have a huge role in teaching and learning uh today's uh, technology today's lecture is all based out of a smartphone and out of my uh, apple macbook pro uh, we are doing multiple live webinars you have seen it you have been part of it Uh, i have been working on the thoracic gurus uh, platform and uh, we are relaying education even though we are in the middle of a shutdown even though the whole uh, country is not able to get out of the house we are still able to reach hundreds of people across the world hundreds of surgeons sitting on their own uh, iphones sitting on their own uh, uh, computers are listening to us and so this is really really amazing uh, use of technology in in very very difficult times and not only are we doing that we are also putting question and answers to you guys so there is a certain group which i am actually teaching i i call it a one minute education where i put in a gra a curve or a graph and i ask them to identify a b c d and they write back or they you can do this live and then you can have any type of education that you want and it can be a personalized education it doesn't have to be a 3 hour lecture just 1 minute of looking at this graph can teach you so many things that you will use in your clinical practice so this is 
the way we are going and beauty of it is everything that's recorded everything is out there on youtube videos uh, the surgical videos are there diego has published hundreds of uniportal videos i have robotic videos other surgeons across asia are all contributing to myatap.com uh, they are contributing to youtube and this education platform is making a huge difference because suddenly i've realized that people are logging on to these lecture series and in their own time and they are making notes and they are writing things so when the lecture is going live they don't really have to uh, you know write and get distracted they listen to the lecture and then they go back and they review the lecture and particularly when they are exam going they will uh, get back to this platform and they will uh, revise for their exam so i think technology is playing a huge role in all of this in addition to this you have got lots of other availabilities for cmes uh you have medscape you have epocritus uh, pepid up to date any of these you can use if you want to identify a, 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 a sort of current update if you want to get latest cmes or also you can use these platforms when you want to get re accredited so like in the uk all of us have to have done a certain amount of cmes 40 hours uh, when we go for our appraisals and uh, very often if you've not had a time to attend any meeting in the year you can go on to these websites and you can actually do the cme uh, late in the evening and you get a certificate uh, for the number of hours that you've done so it also helps you with your appraisal and uh, helps you with your general medical council commitment so these are real technologies that you must use in your day to day life follow up is great uh, on these platforms uh, uh, my system has a sms clinic reminder every patient who's got a date or a clinic booked with me gets an automatic sms uh, the database gets filled in uh, through these uh, things the clinic letters are dispersed via wifi and the internet and email all operation notes are electronic i hardly ever type any i hardly ever enter anything in nowadays all i have to do is just dictate into a uh, dictaphone and that gets picked up and uh, the standard formatting is already there so the important points of the operation get added to it and and the operation node is reproduced and then of course the billing system is all gone on on the internet system so we actually hardly ever worry about billing nowadays it's all uh, automatic all i have to do is fill in a code and the moment i fill in a code the whole bill is reproduced and it gets docked to the patient so invoicing billing and collection of the billing is all electronic no longer do you need anybody to actually go and uh, talk to the patient and and even the the transaction the final to financial transaction is all online on various platforms either either online banking or online transfer or card payments they are all gone electronic uh there is this new technology which is come in which is called as a smart bandage so when you finish your surgery and you put this smart bandage on the wound the the bandage reads the condition of the wound so the patient can have gone home but you're getting a live relay and feedback of whether the temperature of the wound is okay is there any pus accumulating in the wound is there calor dolor things like that so this actually gives you a feedback if there is early infection being developed in the wound uh my friend in cardiology i was talking to him yesterday and he is not worried about the covid at all he he does uh, he does uh, cardiophysiology cardiac physiology and all his patients whatever pacemakers he has put whatever devices he has put almost all of those devices are bluetooth enabled and because they are bluetooth enabled and they work via a certain secure network he gets all information on his computer and he can follow up any patient no matter where they are in the world so this is this is really made his life easy i was i was asking him well, how is he managing his clinics and all he had to say was actually i'm sitting at home in front of my computer and all my patients data is electronically beamed to me so i don't really have to do any face to face clinic anymore on the digital suction device for thoracic surgery again the same bluetooth technology is being in installed into the next generation of suction devices so the patient can go home with a flutter bag and and this digital device and the digital device will talk to you it will give you feedback on what is happening with the patient 
The patient doesn't even need to phone you. And when the flutter stops, the digital suction device will tell you that the flutter has stopped. Please call him back to the hospital and take the drain out. So these uh, interactive technologies are coming in. And the time is still only 6 p.m. You, you have spent your day, uh, you know, done whatever else you want to do. And then when on the way back on the train, you have all got WhatsApp. And so you phone your family uh, at home in India. You catch up on Netflix. You decide what is the next movie we're going to watch in the evening with your daughter. Uh, catch up on all the other stuff and emails. And, and that's life. That's life. Really, technology has become a part of our everyday lives. Now, the problems with these things are that there could be a serious information overload. It is, it is very, very important to keep this factor in mind that you are getting so much information. So you could be mentally tired. You could get eye strain. There is a sense of loss of privacy. I find it very difficult when people WhatsApp me and expect me to reply back within two seconds. Uh, or when people uh, email me and next day write to me saying, why haven't you replied to my email? I mean, I could be busy. You know, when you send me a WhatsApp, I could be in the bathroom. You don't know that. So this is a real issue. This loss of privacy and me time is, is a real issue when you go down the technology route. And of course, the phones ringing when you are uh, sitting with your family or when you're having dinner uh, is, is very important. So we personally actually switch off the phones. We just completely switch off the phones when we are with me time or when we are with family time. Uh, and the expectation of patients have also gone up. They, they expect you to respond to them uh, you know, in the middle of the night because he's got constipation for three days. I mean, really, could that not wait till tomorrow morning? So this is a problem uh, with technology. The patients feel that they own you. So it is, it is important to, to understand these shortcomings of using uh, smartphones and technologies. What smartphone? I, I personally would uh, suggest uh, if you have got access, use, uh, and if you've got the funding, use a high-end iPhone or the Samsung Note series, uh, because they have good battery time. For me, the most important criteria for a phone is the battery time. It must last me through the day. Uh, storage is uh, also an issue. So most of my phones have either 128 uh, gigabyte storage, or I carry a small uh, attachable hard, uh, small uh, uh, USB disc, which can plug into the phone. And most of the times I try to keep my phones and no personal data on the phones. So that if somebody hacks my phone, he will get nothing. So everything I will transfer to a small USB which gets transferred to a hard disk drive. Uh, the issue is of course they are expensive. And the more important problem is when they fall from your hand and the screen breaks, it, it's a real expensive issue when uh, you have to replace the screen. And the worst scenario would be if you lose your phone because all your contacts, all your emails are on the phone. So we make sure that they are all locked. Uh, most of my phones, you cannot open them. Uh, iPhone 11 has got great security features and it has got face recognition things. But you don't need to use these uh, expensive phones. I think the cheaper alternatives are available in a country like India. You've got OnePlus, you've got Huawei, Xiaomi, Redmi. And the beauty of these phones is they are cheap and you've got lots of power and use them for six months or one year and throw them away, buy the latest one next. So you have that option. You can actually now buy a really decent sized smartphone uh, for a decent price, you know, for a couple of hundred pounds, you can actually get a very, very good uh, high end uh, smartphone. But of course you've got to be, you got to worry about the security and things like that on these phones. Uh, whenever you use smartphones, don't forget the accessories. Most of us buy the expensive smartphone, but we don't forget, uh, we forget about the accessories. Don't forget online cloud storage is not free. You have to pay for it and it is a monthly payment. So that has to be taken into account. Always have a very high power power bank because the last thing you want to do is you're in the middle of a consultation and your phone goes dead. That is really unprofessional and really sad. So you must have a power bank to back up. Uh, I personally have a Wi-Fi connected hard disk, so I don't even need to plug in the hard disk. Uh, I can use in any size hard disk uh, with my phones. Screen protectors are a must and a leather case is a must to make sure that the phone doesn't get damaged. 